So I wear a few hats locally. I've been organizing the co-organizing the Portland Linux Unix group for about oh several years since 2009. Uh, I talked about that quite a bit yesterday in my talk about enduring communities. So check that out. Hopefully it's recorded. And yes, we had Linus Torvalds twice, technically three times. And we used to meet in this building, which is kind of cool. So we got pushed out and then to the engineering center, and now we're at the Oregon Latvian Center. I've been giving talks on the BSDs at the BSD cons, Asia BSD con, BSD can, Euro BSD con, and the Storage Developer Summit in Silicon Valley, and VBSD con, Meet BSD. Uh, I helped organize BSD can this year, and that was quite a great adventure with an amazing team. By trade, I do enterprise software storage support for, say, Hollywood type organizations and small businesses with free NAS, true NAS. So that's been keeping me busy and it's with entirely open source tools. I'll touch on that slightly in, at the end there. Uh, I've kind of gone from AV guy at the Oregon Latvian Center to a board member. My wife's a, a chairperson and we will be hosting the Open ZFS Developer and User Summit in October and you're welcome to come. And I was a, well, I guess I did student government way back in high school and college, and then I was part of the local neighborhood association, which was very educational about the wetware factors in communities. So you can ask me about those if, if they don't come up in the tech talk. So anyway, I'm here to talk about ARM, and you have in this track for days, and you will for days, and you know, for a lot of people, it's that drawer of Raspberry Pis and other gadgets they bought back when they were 35 bucks and such, and I almost brought a drawer to just show my collection, et cetera. And FreeBSD, oh, that thing from the 90s, oh, that thing from my first job, oh, that thing from the BBS I used back in the day or tried in a VM recently, and it, it's out there. And you probably each have a different definition of that project and the other BSDs, OpenBSD. Are there any OpenSSH users in the room? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone not using OpenSSH? So yeah, it's like the most pervasive open source software out there. That's what success looks like. And well, yeah, it runs the internet and you can ignore it. You can laugh at it, whatever. I don't, I'm fine. I can take it. So fast forward to like right now, right here. So uh, server side, yep, there's been Intel domination and obviously ARM64 is putting the most pressure on that as an alternative for good reason. And I'll touch on some of that why and that. It is a licensed architecture. It's not free and open. Uh, I think RISC-V came out of Berkeley, but it'll be quite a while before it is taking on you know, a lot of these spaces that are discussed in this room. And obviously, it's huge and mobile and embedded. It's, it, it, it won. <laughs> a few years ago, there were like Intel-based phones, as I recall. And so it's like, OK, that's cool. That's great. But yeah, we'll get to why that's kind of baggage. Uh, so as for embedded, I can't even speak to how many things. My fridge has it, my dishwasher. I don't know. I, I prefer it not have Wi-Fi or any access to the internet, but still, somehow those things creep in. So we have the world's greatest like cat video super tube line. It goes from the servers that stream that content to your phone while you're on the toilet and we've got like both ends totally covered. It is amazing. <laughs> and you're nodding in agreement. So it's like, well, that's what it is. I'm sorry, but I'm going to, you know, call it what it is. But in this, we leave this bathtub curve where the, the, the servers slam it out there at 100 gigabit and the Phones have 5G and they consume those cat videos. So in the middle, it's been a bit chaotic. Um, filling that bathtub, I'm sorry to say there's been a bit of a trail of tears. I was going to bring that drawer of devices like, oh, right, this one support, was supported by this release and that one. And I have a build that I, I'm terrified to touch because it works. The Raspberry Pi, the Orange Pi, the Banana Pi, rock this, rock that, you name it, all these cool things. And uh, I will personally not be liking the device trees and the U-boot and the thing and like, oh, I have the right board, but is there an up to date that one? And then, okay, speaking at the Software Freedom Conservancy provided event, like, okay, so the licensing of a, a device tree file, is that copyrightable? Is that GPLable? Is that permissive? It's like, I don't want to worry about these things. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've got like perhaps a job to do or I just want to play, you know. So um, many of these are surviving. The uh, uh, Orange Pi, Pi Plus, whatever, it's exciting, and I'll get to the, the little factors there. But there was this whole lockdown thing, supply chain, you name it. And oops, suddenly that $35 Raspberry Pi that was literally at the other plug location in the vending machine, in that machine, you like, ting, ting, you could buy one right there next to an Arduino. It was like, awesome. 
that's Portland for you. That model didn't like survive pressure from supplies and all that. It's like, oh, well, there's a foundation that does something and the thing and the thing. It's like, wait, I can get a, like a Dell R720 off Craigslist cheaper than a Pi off a site. It's like, wait, the, okay, fine, I, I'll, fine. <laughs> so yeah, it, they got expensive really quick, unobtainable. And there are sites dedicated to like Pi Finder. It's like, you know, where to, no, oh, make it easy, please make it easy. So personally, I just want like a mini ITX slot with a PCIe slot and I can like experiment with networking, experiment with storage. I can just do stuff, try it, just tinker, something different every day. Uh, I'm, in, I'm, I'm impressed with the solid run folks and I actually mailed them just the other day and they said, yep, we support FreeBSD and UEFI and I'm like, okay, cool, but 900 bucks is a little, little stiff for competing with what was like the, mentally the $35 territory. It's like, okay. Uh, the Rock 5 ITX looks exciting. That's cool, and it's not too expensive. Someone kindly donated. I will get to that. The ThinkPad X13S. I will explicitly talk about that in a slide or two. <laughs> so, someone kindly gave an OverDrive 1000, and it's got two SATA ports, which is great. It's got serial. It's got no PCI, and I'm like, I love this thing. It's great, but that's limiting. Uh, Firefly ITX just came up. I think they have a. a sort of their own compute module on an ITX board. It's like, okay, okay. Conclusive in Pol Poland made one. And in all practicality, that bathtub is filled with Apple products. Just love it or hate it. And whoever can help them out, I don't like that they solder in storage, but darn it, it's quick, it's available, it's predictable. It's expensive, but it's available. And so if you can kind of Balance that, at least it's predictable. Yay, so thank you Asahi Linux. I don't know if anyone is here with the project, but yay Asahi, because if you talk to the OpenBSD folks, they're like, okay, start with the Asahi, ins Asahi installer. Okay, great, cool. I'm not gonna argue with that. I, I want that sucker working. Um, so kindly people have donated an overdrive, as I mentioned, a Thunder X, an old classic big old box that takes forever to boot, but it's a pretty cool all, all around machine once it's up. I've got my fruit boards, and I am excited about that Orange Pi 5 Plus, which supports UEFI, FreeBSD, and a certain hardware feature I'll get to in a moment. I am all for donations. If you've got scratch and dent, if you're phasing out stuff, uh, also from the keynote, uh, the OSU OSL can also use hardware, and he showed off his cool, like, uh, brand new from yesterday, uh, RISC V array with lots of ARM back in the closets there. So we're at a crossroads, and it's getting exciting. So UEFI is here, I'll touch on that. And the GIC V3, is anyone familiar with the generic interrupt controller? I see two hands, cool, I'll touch on that. Three, sweet. Okay, so fast forward to FreeBSD. I'll just, for those who are like, yeah, I tried it once, I'll just go through some of the top features or the ones that matter to me. So um, with OpenBSD, we touched on like OpenSSH. Any users? Yeah, all of them, welcome Lance. Um, they are universal donor operating system. They have licenses that allow that OpenSSH to show up in Windows. That, if there is no other definition of succeeding in open source trying to penetrate hostile territory, there it is. So yay, and I'll skip that question. Any other OpenSSH users having asked it? So as for those flying high-speed cat videos from those servers to the handheld devices, they're going through TCP stacks that came out of Berkeley from day one after the BBN stack tipped over. It's like, well, this one works, and Kirk gives great talks on that, check it out. Uh, apparently that's a stack in Windows, or was for a long time, just it works. Router vendors sprouted out of that, it works. Um, they have unified V4 and V6 in one stack as opposed to like two separate contraptions, go figure. Um, most of that's managed with OpenSSH. It, it's just, that's what we do, there's, I guess, Mosh, and and the open SSH folks will be first to say, we don't want a mono monopoly and monoculture. We, from a security perspective, please have some diversity. And it's like, but it works. I'm like, well, yeah, but. So thanks to licensing, just about every mobile device from every vendor has BSD code. Like NetBSD, LibC, I think, in Android, and iOS obviously has its, its next computer-derived I stuff. So it's out there. And when Netflix is pushing out up to 40% of the evening traffic over FreeBSD network stack and stock FreeBSD from the current development tree, just they, they snap it down, they 
they have a big enough network to like do A, B, C, D testing and just try a few here, try a few here, and that finds bugs really fast. And there was a great chat at the great slide at the uh, vendor summit last fall where it's like, okay, with this release, we got 10 gig, 25 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig, and they're just pushing that and doing like KTLS kernel assisted encryption. It's like, well, <laughs> we want to go faster under all circumstances, and they do it wide open. There's, there's nothing like proprietary ship slamming stuff out the network device. So, uh, nope, BSD is not dying. That's been a meme that's actually come up recently, and it was a hot thing in the 90s, and remember Slashdot? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, whatever. Um, a lot of the BSDs are backed by public benefit, 501c3, nonprofits, not unlike Conservancy, who's putting on this event. Uh, so I did a little quick one-click research. Uh, take it off PDX can help remove those CentOS tattoos for those who are like thinking this is like, oh wow, this community facing it. This is like, what, 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 what are you doing? You're now upstream, like, wait, what? So it seems that nonprofits are really important because they have literally a legally defined mission and enforceable mission and defendable mission, and the IRS will say, hey, you're not following your mission. So the license won't change on you. The, the, the code won't vanish from you. Go Debian with SPI, yay. It's, and I did some research, there are not a lot of Linux projects, distribution projects, backed by actual nonprofits. That would be great if there are more, yay. So what is FreeBSD? Some of you may know this up one side and down the other. I'll just throw out a few features I like. It's a feature-rich, permissively licensed, general purpose operating system. That runs on ARM64, so welcome, we're in the right room. Um, it is a unified code base, and uh, some of you will have zero interest in what that means. Some of you will have a visceral understanding of what that means. There is a single unified ports tree, and then a docs tree, and a port, uh, base OS, ports for ported software, packages, you name it, and documentation. And they're just, they've always been out there. They've gone from like CVS to SVN to Git, and whatever's gonna be next year, they'll probably adopt that. And you can, and I'll have the commands later, you can create installation media with like three commands. I think Allison Randall will be here. She's amazing. She was a release engineer for Canonical. And at a plug meeting, advanced topics, I feel very bad that I asked her what's it look like to just release Ubuntu. And it was a very long answer. And I got more and more uncomfortable as she's describing all these teams communicating, all the, I'm like, okay, well, while this is just the raw OS, Three commands. Um, okay, I'm sorry. So it has, as I touched on, a fast, definitive TCP IP stack. It, it, RFCs are kind of awesome, especially if, it, if you have good implementations. Uh, again, position of OpenBSD is like, look, please don't reinvent the wheel. Please, seriously. No, we've tried it. We, we've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. Just if something works, please run with it. Nope, no strings attached. Take it. Uh, unified uh, IPv4 and V. Six stack, any uh, Linux uh, firewall hackers here who just kind of think, oh, let's do everything twice. <laughs> so there's that. There's a lot of virtual networking, and there has been for years, VNet, NetGraph. And that's very interesting in virtualized and containered environments because that infrastructure has been there a very long time. It's had terrible press, occasional bugs, but it's out there. And of course, packet filter from OpenBSD, but accelerated for FreeBSD, IPFW, Firewall, so uh, I'll touch on all these in some way along we go. Uh, I'm a storage guy. There are great unified storage tools. The entire stack, geom and things that you need not worry about, but gpart, the partitioning tool, is my very favorite on this planet from any, at any price. Um, the unification of all that in one tree starts to show. So if you say, say add JSON output with libx so on this utility, it's like, well, let's add it to this one, this one, this one, and not talk to those 40 projects to like get everyone on the same page who have never met, I don't know. Um, and it's fast, and it's running a whole lot of production stuff. I mentioned Kirk earlier. He is uh, known for the fast file system, which became the uh, UFS. Uh, what's the U? I should know this. Uh, Unix file system, duh. And later soft updates and snapshotting and other stuff. And even Netflix, who I mentioned earlier, is asking for features like an actual snapshot and other kind of, uh, he's got a great recent talk and 
modern features on an old file system because let Netflix lets stuff fail in place. If, if a drive goes down, well, you pull the videos from over here. It's great. Um, Kirk's model is what everything uses. EXTE, XFS, NTFS, they all follow that model until you get to, well, definitive copy on right file systems. Open ZFS out of Sun. They thought, let's just throw out all the old stuff. Let's start fresh. Yes, there are hard, hard, higher hardware requirements, but when they started, things were getting nice and fast and cheap. So it's like, well, let's embrace that, lean into it. So uh, I hope ButterFS and uh, BcacheFS and friends make it great, but they're still kind of struggling. And well, such is life. Um, FreeBSD is the only OS to ship with OpenZFS. OpenZFS is the independent project that kind of wiggled out of Linux ZFS and Illumos and FreeBSD, which was adopting it. And they were like, wait, we're all kind of doing the same thing, overlapping, stepping on our toes. Illumos is still on their own kind of cherry pick features. Uh, you can then add OpenZFS to Mac OS. I run it for a decade. Uh, now Windows, I was the first person to use it on real hardware. NetBSD is following the Illumos model and they have a really small team. So it's just kind of struggling there, but that's cool. I hope it works. Um, Oracle ZFS is still Oracle ZFS with completely incompatible features. So that's cool. I, they, I, I, I wish they'd open all that software that uh, Sun opened up. That would be great. If you know anyone at Oracle and this came up last year at Fossey, it's like, that'd be great. You know, nice license that everyone can use. Anyway, D-Trace Tracing, which came out of Sun. Just definitive modern tracing, also known as a root kit, but really good for debugging things. And as I touched on earlier, growing libxo. So let's just have a Unix environment. What if there's a special flag to throw out? JSON, building an appliance. You really want that. You really, really want that so that you can hand it over to your like web interface team in minutes, not years. It's just like, okay, here's what do you need? Flag, 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 have a nice day. Ah, uh, that's cool. Anyone familiar with smart mon tools, smart control and disk monitoring and all that? They finally sprouted JSON output. They changed their schema without updating the number to it. It's like, guys, oh no. Yes, it, from the distance it looks like that, but just, okay. Is anyone not familiar with Control T? SIG info, run a DD command, hit Control T, it gives you status. I've, I'm like, I jumped down to a Linux box, I want to DD wipe a disk or something, and it just says, if I don't have a Tmux and they're screened and all that, it's like, it appears frozen. I don't know if it's still doing stuff. I will wait. <laughs> but with, it's pretty universal in Sun, Lumos, and other Unix OSs. Control T, boom, it sometimes gives you percentage of a decompression. Just really helpful, nice stuff. So the trifecta. Uh, FreeBSD jails arrived in 2000. They're the definitive container. That came up a few times, it inspired it was from Chirrut, it inspired zones on Solaris and Lumos, and in various ways, Docker and friends and all those things. Um, it is so tightly integrated that one doesn't think much about it. It's just a resource. If you have an application, just throw it in there with a, a thin user land. And there's now package base, which was something I absolutely loved about Red Hat back in the 90s here in town. It was like, Everything is accounted for. I like that. Actually, that makes perfect sense rather than layers of software, but then RPM hell burned me. I discovered jail so I can contain stuff, delete the entire thing at once. Yay. Uh, there is a Beehive hypervisor that arrived in FreeBSD 10. I was the first user of it outside of NetApp, and it's grown slowly and nicely. We'll get to that in a sec. No, that's not Royal We. I will get to that in a sec. And there is even Zen hypervisor support. It doesn't get much attention, but it's there, and it's like... I've been help working with uh, Roger to get fixed bugs, et cetera. OpenZFS, which I touched on. If you're curious about any of these, I've given talks about them around the world. Just search my name in any of those. Beehive.org is something I manage. And um, yeah, just I like these technologies. It took a very long time, but I think after, after rethinking this for decades, I really like these. So uh, there are also uh, three weekly calls I host, one on Jails, one on OpenZFS, and one on Beehive. You can go to callfortesting.org, watch those. They are totally transparent, open door. You can listen in. Uh, you can watch the videos on mm, proprietary YouTube. We're looking at Tubix and friends, the, the free tube, free thing thing. Uh, and even uh, Fossey's using that. Um, 
we are largely organizing the user-facing part of the conference in the open. It's like, well, what do people want? How do we focus in on like what real world up to date? A bit like an unconference, but let's have a little more warning than that morning. Um, and here's a dirty little secret. There's a wide open agenda doc. If you put your question there and it's interesting to other people, we'll probably discuss it. We'll probably have it on the video. Just sit back and relax and we do the work for you. So it, it's been working really well. It's resulted in features in jail, which is really pent up. It was like jail was on autopilot. Just if there was a bug, he'd fix it. He's in Silverton, Oregon. I only learned that in Canada. It's really weird. My, I touched on that in my talk yesterday. Um, the production user calls came out of Beehive developer calls because we talk about the hypervisor and then ZFS for like two hours. Hmm. <laughs> let's let's break that out and it's it's working. So, and the whole notion of production users, yeah, this industry is. If we look at that bathtub curve, there are really noisy hobbyists and YouTubers of various quality, <laughs> and their vendors. And vendors have budgets, so like just say, hey, we're going to have a a billboard in the airport. <laughs> the, the hobbyists don't have that. But in between, there are countless companies using free software. And if they're in insurance or something, or as a client of mine, makes tugboats, they really don't care in the best possible way and the worst possible way. That it's just whatever does the job. So on to that point, this is from the, the before times, pre-lockdown. I remember Dexter's Law which is only proprietary software vendors want proprietary software. Given a choice, people in the best sense don't care. And in, in Latvia, a Latvian Mexican heritage dentist sat me down for coffee and he's like, have you heard of open office? I'm like, yeah, yes, yes I have. <laughs> yes, I know Michael, was it Meeks and company? He's like, yes, yes, that's awesome. And so he's like, it's, it's free. You can actually do most office things with this free thing. I'm like, <laughs> been saying, <laughs> been saying. So thank you, Fossey, because uh, this event is a great just reunion and reminder, and I'll touch on that a little more. So a little more detail about the trifecta jails. Like it wrote the book. Uh, thank you, Paul Henning Camp, who set that up for a hosting provider. It's like, well, we want to like put Apache web servers in different jails and keep them separate, keep clients separate. That should be a, that's a pretty familiar notion these days. Uh, and it wrote the book, and it's been around since 2000. That was a very, very long time ago. I touched on OpenZFS. It's, the Z is for Zettabyte, but also the last word in file systems. It's very good. The license is really complicated. Yep, the Linux folks in them have been butting heads, and uh, there are many solutions to that, including use FreeBSD. It's integrated. Have a nice day. Just I'm, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> Fast, scalable. Uh, it can scale up to a few petabytes without much effort and across, and it's... It's a layer below your POSIX data, and you can send from that Raspberry Pi home lab to a petabyte array, and it's the same verified data, checksummed, and you name it, and it's awesome. And uh, no snark, you care about your data. It's like it is checksumming as you go, and I've had data in my machines since the 90s in college, and I don't know what bit rot I've suffered from. Not a clue. Don't know. There's no way to validate, and I don't have like MD5 from back then in college. Like, what? Oh, beehive. Um, so, hardware assisted virtualization. What a concept. And thank you, AMD and Intel and friends, for, say, the uh, Nahalem, which had real early goodies, but then come Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge. It's like, wait, this works and I can afford it. And what a concept. So, uh, there are advantages to not emulating a 1980 PC. Just, I'll lay it out there and I'll touch on that a few more times, but then you hear about the QEMU floppy vulnerabilities and it's like, wait, wait, <laughs> wait I, don't, I literally don't understand the sentence. I'm sorry, I'm moving on. So this trifecta works on that, well, I'll just, in these contexts, that Raspberry Pi and that Ampere. The, the OS don't care. It's not an embedded OS. It's not Yocto. Yocto is awesome, but it's just, it's like, what do you want to do today? So, uh, I'm running it on various size stuff, my son Thunder X to the Raspberry Pi 400 keyboardy thing, which is kind of cool. And that whole filling the bathtub and covering that span and not emulating a 1980 PC is a really good description of ARM64. It's like, well, uh, I'll, 
I'll touch on the copyright briefly. Um, so only time will tell, like, is permissive or copyleft the way to achieve software freedom? I don't know which was a heyday of either, maybe. Uh, we'll see. Give it time. Give it time. Um, I'm a permissive guy based on what I've seen. Just like this works. I personally don't understand freedom through restrictions, but time will tell. And I'll, I'll convince me. Bring it on. I love Bradley Kuhn dearly. He's one of the top enforcers. I, it's, it's, it's life. So I did write an article about this because BSD gets beaten up on for like giving stuff away and a vendor can run with it. Well, uh, it's a curse to not give back. So all those cool router vendors I touched on with that ne network stack, oh yeah, rock and roll, Nokia. You laugh your way to the bank until you realize the community has like 64-bit addressing and SMP. And you're with your own little fork in your corner like, oh, oh. So the junipers of the world spent years resynchronizing with Upstream, which has like really cool stuff available. And some of them, like NetApp, has the, had the foresight to do a simple hypervisor. And so, yeah, it, it is not helpful to think you know better. Just when you have like, say, 100 developers and there are, you're competing with 1,000 developers, just do the math. It's as simple. So, hey, yeah, it's permissive, but eh. And also think back to compilers. It's like, is there a single compiler that succeeded as a paid product. Uh, LLVM and GCC just, it's like, why? Maybe special purpose ones, but no. Anyway, um, also briefly on licensing. Gee, FreeBSD is at the heart of uh, TrueNAS Core, PFSense, OpenSense. These are like definitive YouTuber storage and network operating systems that are all like Linux, but they're not Linux, but still it's, it's, they own that space. And an observation for me was that looking at, well, maybe not PFSense, but you can build the others. Uh, like, that's what the GPL is like advocating for. You can like download it, build it, install it. It's like, yeah, great. Well, we do that. We're not obliged to, but we, we just, uh, that's just how you do it. <laughs> it's like we, we all Unix folks don't understand otherwise. Like, you're hurting yourself to not like make it easy. So, FreeBSD on ARM64. That all said, uh, the very much early 32-bit stuff arrived in 2005 with 6.0. Uh, things got interesting with 64-bit in 2016 with 11.0, and it became a tier one architecture. A, now a few releases back, around 14.1 for the official release, 13.0 just said, hey, we're going to have packages. We're going to have all the tests we can support, we, and that's kind of cool and very important for this talk. As for the fruit boards, um, they're still supported. Yes, you have a question. Oh, thank you. That's a, that's a FreeBSD notion insofar as uh, if there is a, let's just say, a bug in that architecture that's pretty significant, it will stop the release until it's fixed because it's going to be released exactly the same day as every other architecture. So today they're like phasing out 32-bit Intel, which thank you. Uh, all the vulnerabilities. Intel phased out 32-bit Intel because the, the developers are like, we're not going to support mitigations on a platform that like, no, we're going to focus here. So they're focusing on uh, pretty much AMD 64 architecture, ARM 64, uh, up and coming uh, RISC-V, and sorry, uh, Lance, those, those power PC machines are going kind of to tier two unless someone really wants to dive in and adopt them and give them us a use case and make them the underlying theme, make it easy, make it affordable. If they're willing to make them easy and affordable, which ironically was a Mac back in the day filling that bathtub. Uh, okay, great. So fortunately, uh, UEFI, does that answer your question? Awesome. Uh, UEFI systems, just they, they kind of work. Thank you, whoever's behind that. And uh, thank you, Rebecca Cran, doing lots of EDK2 work. Thank you. <laughs> if no one said it, I'll take this moment right here to say thank you. <laughs> so about that bathtub, which I will keep. Uh, Pining on? <laughs> there are official project images for Pine64, Pinebook, uh, Rock64, Rock Pro 64 Raspberry Pi, and then in ports, you can add uh, U-Boot, which often is just the goodies you need, and it has a DD instruction, say, just slam this on a, like a generic image or otherwise, and up, up it goes. And I got that working on, I think, a Pine board. I didn't bring it, but okay. I, 
From a user's perspective, that's a great start. Pick from that list, and if you want to get your feet wet, dive into the other ones. And if someone wants a, 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 a parts uh, pine book, it's all yours. And if you want a Samsung Chromebook, also known as the Snow, which is totally working, uh, it, it technically supports FreeBSD and your Linux of choice, and it still has the original OS. Uh, feel free to grab one of these. I'm cleaning house. So about that Git v3, which I confess I had not heard of, nor cared, nor whatever. It is the generic interrupt controller. Hmm, okay, fine. That's the equivalent to all the nifty Intel stuff that arrived for hardware-assisted virtualization. So it's a keeping track of page tables, saying here's the VM page table, here's the host, because now we have to like separate these things. And so a bit like the pop count on Intel that arrived with, I believe, Nehalem and got good with Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge. It's in ARM, what a concept. So stuff got real. <laughs> um, as for the themes of this room, why big iron arm? Yeah, you're not emulating a 1980s PC. There's like a power savings right off the bat, just boom, in an instant, if you're not like making it feel like 1980, put on the leg warmers, whatever metaphor you want. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, just reading an Ampere announcement, up to 256 cores per socket, is that accurate? Am I wrong? Is it more or less? I've heard 192 for a long time. More? How many more? 512. Okay. Yes, exactly. So uh, why do we care? Well, again, that zero obligation to emulate an old PC. Um, Unix doesn't carry that baggage from a 1980 PC. Actually, you know, that whole BSD 386 was like, okay, how do we cram this, this enterprise thing onto toy hardware? And so that's been a battle for years. And remember, all like, wind modems, how do we support them? It's like, oh, no, no, no. Not our problem. So why are we even stressing about, <laughs> I like to say FreeBSD has crap support for crap hardware. Is that an unreasonable expectation when you have a job to do? So I'm like, okay, so we don't have that baggage, nor does ARM64. So I forgot this question. I didn't push it to my slides from yesterday's talk, but it is perfectly appropriate for today too. So I'll slip it in right here. Uh, I was talking to Rob in Australia and we're talking about like Fosse. He's like, this conference right here, right now, post OSCON, post Open Source Bridge, which tried to fill that niche. And his comment was, let's just keep the good stuff. I'm like, yes, <laughs> actually that, yes, exactly, precisely. Because we're not burdened by some notion of, well, it's got to run that DOS app from 80. So that said, uh, when you've got those hardware cores, correct me if I'm wrong, there's rarely hyper-threading in ARM environments. Is that, that, yes, please. It does, okay, well, I am the lone hyper-thread user, which is just great for my testing. But when it comes to production, you can pin everything. And uh, Peter in Boston with Ampere gave me a great rundown a few weeks ago, I think was his name. Ah. Uh, he's like, all these use cases, and please get that messaging out there because it's kind of new to me, I should know more. But although I'm now excited about ARM like this month. So uh, storage guy, wait, you can pin a core with no like exotic extra cost per drive, per NIC, a few for the host. It's like, oh, per VM, per, oh, 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 okay. So you get perhaps uh, HPC predictable performance because, well, these machines, these virtual machines are actually pretty equal as opposed to pray you don't get the wrong vCPU. So he made great points about quality of service guarantees. And that's, I guess, Oracle's pulling that off with their cloud, where it's like, yeah, you've, when you have a CPU, a vCPU, it's actually a core, it's yours, that's it. And no one's, you're not competing with others. And my observation, like, we can afford that? Wait, what, what? <laughs> that's cool, as the Beehive guy like oh this thinkpad has uh four you know two cores and four emulated and let's try to you know, not compete with the os and then and i'm very very happy to never worry about that again so it just hit 15 current like last month um it somehow has a limit to 16 vcpus which beehive had for a very long time but i guess the intel topology and socket topology just needs to be reworked for arm and some very lovely people are working on that i tried to spin up PCI pass-through, but that's cool. I'm, I'm not yet worried about 
SRIOV on ARM because I don't even have hard hardware to support it. Unless the Thunder X had SRIOV, I don't know. Don't know. Anyone? Anyone? So um, again, thank you, Asahi Linux folks, because well, I see they don't have the M3 listed from Apple on their wikis and stuff. But 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 in quickly researching this, the next Mac OS warning totally proprietary will support nested virtualization on M3 hardware. Apparently it's in the M2 hardware, but Apple might not unlock it because they're a proprietary vendor and they have to distinguish. Yes, you have news. What about M1? Oh, oh okay. So uh, the comment was patches exist for M2 and M3 in Asahi. That's cool. So if you're not running Mac OS, great. But uh, filling that bathtub curve. Uh, Mac OS being available probably on, on this very street, you can go run and pay a bunch of money for a thing. The fact that that will let you bring up your Linux distro of choice or FreeBSD and have nested virtualization for development with a VM in a VM, that gets exciting. Uh, running OpenSense under a FreeBSD development VM to have a really fancy VPN to home office, whatever, like this will be interesting. This will be very interesting. Watch this space and do help out the Asahi people. I'm excited. So what does it look like? I mean, here's a, I'll geek out very briefly. Um, uh, the kernel module for several hypervisors is called VMM, and just load the thing. Just, let's just load that sucker up, and key point, uh, watch in your D message for Gik v3, and it'll pop up in uh, the console messages when it's loaded. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> so I get really excited when a new board I've got is like, hello, I, I, there's a chance. Uh, the, Pine, something, one of the pines. Uh, it loaded the kernel module, but I couldn't run a VM, but who knows, it's, this is, these are early, early days. But Beehive syntax, huh. I love the maturity of QEMU and KVM, but when you have like a three-page invocation, it's like, yeah, that's cool. I like up arrowing and, and, and like waiting a minute to like get the cursor <laughs> to go by. Like, so anyway, uh, throw, whoop, whoop, boom. So uh, give it, in this case, eight cores up to 16, fine with one, defaults to one. It probably defaults to a, a 1024 RAM, but uh, standard console just blasted out standard I.O. It uses a U-boot crafted uh, boot ROM. Doesn't yet have VNC support, we'll find out. And if anyone wants to work on an RDP VNC-like thing for QEMU and friends, that'd be great. Just saying, just saying. And uh, Verdio net networking as such. It's like Verdio storage in what's just a raw file for here, but it could point at a hardware device. I'll talk about why that's so cool. An example of OpenSense, which I just thought, oh, I found an unofficial OpenSense image. I will just try booting it, and boom, I had OpenSense on, on old Thunder X under FreeBSD 15, and like, that's, uh, that looks familiar. <laughs> so, um, uh, points of order, I, I don't like dependencies. The whole notion that you have this nifty management stack that has 40 dependencies, and Heaven forbid Python go from two to three or three to something to something to something. I troll people about how's that Python 4 migration coming in. I'm like, I, I want it in base. I do because it's this whole familiar, this muscle memory of like stuff's here. It does take some horse trading to get something in there. I'd love to have Tmux in base, which OpenBSD has. It's, it's a very tangible desire. The license is fine. The code is familiar. It's like, okay, what would it take? Who would, ob who would object? You know, and they're, they're kind of democratic about that, which is cool. And also, I never want to see an installer again, ever. Nope, I don't. The next, next, next finish is a very 90s proprietary software model, and you've seen the jokes about the floppies for Windows, uh, what's 11, you know, it's like 500, five, whatever. So it's like, no, that, that was then. So, and then there are many cloud contraptions, but, 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 here's what's got my, got, got me interested, and I realized, what I will discuss next has been living in my head rent-free for like 20 years. From the moment I sat down with RPM Hell and discovered jail and thought, I want a small jail, and there were no easy ways to do that. Well, ah, check my talks. They all touch on this. This stuff is coming together. So I will talk about it today to hopefully get you inspired as much as I'm inspired. So if you're going to leverage that unified OS, leverage the hell out of it. So, as I mentioned earlier, 
to build a release. And I mean install media and stuff. You jump in the source directory, you make it with however many hopefully hardware cores you have, not hyper-threaded, but you do the NCPU, it tells you how many. So it's like, you know, J32 on a pretty beefy system. But now in ARM, with all you ARM cool kids, it's like uh, J512, maybe leave two for the host. Fine, you know, five. <laughs> ah, the future is here. Um, jump into the release directory. This will take time, but on a fast machine, it's fast. Uh, so then here's it gets interesting. Make VM image with images, format raw, ZFS, and out pops a minor miracle, vm.zfs.raw. You can do this as an unprivileged user. It is using libzfs in, an, in a unified ecosystem. I get that like QCOW2 has copy on write and snapshots and stuff and a few features. To we ZFS folks, it's like, that is so ridiculously institutionalized below the surface that we either take a raw image or a zvol, which is a synthetic volume, and that's it. That's the beginning and end of it. And I'm wrapping up, don't worry. We're running out of time. Um, so what you get as an unprivileged user is a bootable disk image. And there's one free BSD, no distro. So it's free BSD. It's a base install. That's it. That's, it is it. it. And they ship VM images on the download sites. Uh, there is like... Uh, uh, what's the Microsoft one? Uh, VHD, but not VHDX. Maybe there are no, no tools, and they're like, why convert? And I'm like, and Microsoft won't take raw images, and quite a few hypervisors won't take a raw image. It's like, ah, okay, you realize you can like splat that thing down to a NVMe drive and boot. Like, it's 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 a boot image, it's not a cloud image. It's just a it, <laughs> so. That said, FreeBSD has had build options, which I've been pounding my head against for 20 years. And as of 14, they all worked because, hey, the, it's, a, it's an, a deep catalog feature that not everyone uses. And they might ask, like, why on earth would you build the OS with, without IPv4 networking and only IPv6 with a single tiny bit of text to build the entire OS right before your eyes with no V4? Well. I like to tinker. <laughs> Don't stop me. Get out of my way. <laughs> so I have a project up there on, this is not an endorsement, but on GitHub, uh, Michael Dexter, Occam BSD. So I stripped everything down to the bare buildable minimum and bootable minimum. So uh, you can have an OS with one command that builds in minutes or less and boots in seconds. Uh, I have little profiles, and you can go wild on those. I'm happy to help. Uh, so you're required to have a profile. Uh, dash V to do virtual machine boot script. So it just does a really nice smoke test of Beehive. QEMU just for, hey, you can try that. Risk 5 or ARM on your other thing in the thing. Uh, and dash ZFS, which leverages the thing I just mentioned to do user space, user, unprivileged user, builds of bootable images which thanks to some bugs I fixed, now can be mirrored. So on your laptop, you can mirror two devices with ZFS and prototype your network and push to real hardware. I've pictured that for a very, very long time. So I explained the flags here. Imagine that. So imagine leverages the heck out of those, those raw VM images. VM, it's just a boot image, people, please. please. So uh, this will pull down a 14.1 FreeBSD ARM image with boot scripts, maybe I should just imply that. The ZFS option, there's UFS and ZFS, and it's just a build option I showed a few slides back. And you can target it to a hardware device. Just splat that sucker right out. GrowFS is pretty common in 2024 across most operating systems. Looking at you, Windows, who puts like a recovery partition right after where you did, no, really, really? So, <laughs> See these visceral responses, I love that. I've thrown in OmniOS and Debian images because, well, they publish raw images. Thank you, guys. They generally have, and, and gals and they, and they generally have some oddball compression of choice on their raw image. Some are gzip, some are xz, some are not compressed, and like, okay. And they're all, uh, Debian is shipping ARM images. Sorry, I, I once found Omni, uh, OmniOS ARM images, and there is a project, but they're just not a thing yet. And well, you pick a release, you pick an architecture, it'll just grab whatever you ask and put it where you want. And in a 
productionist environment, you might be deploying all your ARM systems from your little ThinkPad, and so you, have, you need cross operating system awareness, and if it's a disk image, it doesn't care what it is, and if you don't, you just have the right file in the right place, so there's that. Now, if anyone's with an OS project, could you please, 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 one, publish raw images, two, give the architecture, a lot of them still say, you know, bootimage.raw, and then bootimage-arm64.raw. It's like, well, how about we just institutionalize that? And FreeBSD is actually really good about this, and I, I rely on consistent URLs and stuff. So it is dash AMD64, it is dash ARM64, dash RISC-5, as opposed to, well, we still think everything's by default Intel, and then alternatively. So uh, in, if, if, if I were uh, uh, king for a day, I'd say, look, just clean up your downloads. And I reserve the right to beat up on my wonderful OpenBSD friends who have like install 47.iso. Is it OpenBSD? Don't know. Is it, a, is it for ARM? Don't know. <laughs> it's like, oh, please, please, please don't make it hard. Repeat reoccurring theme. Just don't make it harm, hard. Um, anything like cloud in it is icing on the cake. Great. But that's, we each have our really strong opinion of what the perfect cloud deployment thing is use the one you want. So that's where a raw image is the lowest common denominator, universal starting point, and we'll go from there. And oh no, if you know it doesn't have a password, well, step one, you know that and need to set that. And it's like, you know, do you trust the safety on the gun or do you just assume it's loaded? Well, just, it's risky. Yes, we know. Just fix it. Just, that's step one. That's step one. <laughs> so uh, make it easy. I'm pretty darn sure having boot images from every OS I can find that show up in a few minutes is really good to adoption. It's like that's, and actually there is a call for testing call where I just got it working on the Thunder X and we just, as a group, just found every download we could and just started throwing stuff at it. Like try this, try this. And yes, question? I prefer raw so there's no conversion. And thank you, QMU image. It's a conversion tool. It takes some, either a few seconds or it takes forever on a big image. Um, this, does have oh, they do? So it's a start, and I could integrate the conversion, but I'm just prioritizing just to exercise the entire system of just, okay, it's a off the shelf raw image. It gets a boot wrapper. Off we go. And the faster I can redo that. But yeah. Uh, uh, let's talk Alpine. And uh, the non system DWN is Dev, Dev1, Dev, Devuin, Dev, They don't produce the VM images of any kind. OpenBSD doesn't produce VM images. Um, it's the FAI fully automated installer that just lets you build them. I'm not a Debian person, but it seems real simple. And there is compatibility in FreeBSD, so you could probably build those on FreeBSD. I just haven't had that afternoon to poke at it. But, it's, it's, it's pretty universal stuff. And the more we can test things on other OSs and just have that field day, that, that install-a-thon of, of different OSs on that nifty new, whatever new ARM64 hardware I'll end up at some point with at some point. Um, uh, FreeBSD, hopefully you're convinced based on some of that, makes it delightful to do that, to build the OS and tinker, strip everything out, Put back in what you want. Grab Alpine images, and, and if you realize you need to do that conversion step in the middle, but um, that's been nagging me for 20 years, and I'm really glad it's here. And I'm glad that jumping into ARM64 was just like, oh, literally change the few letters uh, AMD64 to ARM64, and a lot of it just works without intervention. That's cool. Uh, welcome to Portland. Thank you so much for coming. I am totally happy to answer more questions, and you can catch me in the hallway as appropriate. Yes. Berkeley Software Distribution. Um, that's the fact that it was, oh, you probably heard about the Berkeley uh, lawsuit and all that. It was a four-clause license. Originally had an advertising clause that everything had to say. California Berkeley produced this, but once it splintered out to the wilds, they're like, oh, wait, that's actually not us. That's just so they stripped off that clause. And then a company 
Uh, I believe BSDI proudly had that phone number, 1-800-IT'S-UNIX, which is this is lawyer bait. <laughs> and it was lawyer bait. And they got sued. And Linus Torvalds is out there quoted as saying, uh, had the BSDs not had the lawsuit, I'd probably not write Linux. I'm like, okay, oh, okay. He could have been a really good BSD hacker. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. Other questions? Uh, does, everyone, does anyone have hardware that I described here? There's one hand, a few hands, cool, cool. Uh, ask me questions about if you want to try this on that. Uh, yes? Okay, the question about UEFI and things just working. So FreeBSD, and also I'll, I will speak selfishly from what I've experienced. They publish generic ARM64 images that instead of relying on uh, device trees and U-boot, they just knock on the right door and they uh, start up on both the Thunder X, the, and if I image it from just a Thursday snapshot, I just image it to a removable drive and stick it in and everything just works. Um, they've just come up without intervention of any kind on my part. And I was blown away that the uh, Memtest x86 little download that a lot of us have probably used, they've embraced, you, thank you Lance, they've embraced UEFI and you put the same image in an Intel machine or an ARM64 and I had to test my Thunder X as I'm growing the RAM on it and had a little error. You just stick it in and it worked. I'm like, that's, that's actually what this should look like to users. Yes. Interesting. Which is mostly used for supporting the x drivers and things like that. Um, however, you can use that in the imaging facility to also run on the MEM test. Ah, okay, I'll repeat what the, the comment, I, and I didn't know this. So, EDK, Tiana Core EDK2 has some amount of Intel emulation motivated by graphics support, but that might be what's allowing things like just the MEM test just kick in and go. That's cool. That's under documented. Thank you. So if I understood correctly, there is a like native UEFI AP, ABI, I suppose it would be, and then there are expensive tools to build that. But I do remember comments like, well, here's VI for UEFI, and here's your, you know, your favorite utilities. But wow, that's been inconsistently documented. And if I get that EFI prompt, I'm like, I know, reset. And then trying to find a disk, it's like FS colon or something. So. Feel free to make that easier in any way, shape, or form. Any final questions? And I'll be around on and off the next few days. I'm local. Bug me at the, the email on the screen, editor at callfortesting.org, or on the Fediverse. Uh, the Fediverse has legs. I'm impressed. That's why I'm smiling and waving to people in the audience. And I missed a day, and I had 500 messages waiting, which prior to certain meltdowns was like, three messages a week or a month or whatever. Now it's just like, it's actually engagement and it's been great for promoting this event and people asking questions and thank you so much for coming.